Today we are delighted to have with us Marco Di Nunzio. Marco is a social anthropologist who has been working in urban Ethiopia for the past 10 years. He's also a very good friend of mine and I'm particularly happy that he's here with us today. He's currently a lecturer at the Department of Anthropology and African Studies of the University of Birmingham. Marco is the author of the book, The Act of Living, Street Life, Marginality and Development in Urban Ethiopia, published by Cornell University Press. Today, he will present this intriguing book, which I had the pleasure to read before and after publication. To you, Marco. Okay. Thanks a lot, Diego, and thanks a lot for, uh, for having me. Uh, and I'm sorry about my lockdown uh, haircuts. Um, so whenever I see myself on Zoom, I always feel that, you know, this is time for another lockdown haircut. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the book, about the main characters of, of, of the book. Um, that, you know, the book revolves around the stories where the main protagonists of the book are two men, which I call here Haile uh, and Ibrahim. And I will tell you a little bit how their stories intersect with the stories of a range of others in inner city, others, as well as uh, the wider history of the country and how we can make sense of the life trajectories to understand politics marginality and exclusion and, and, and living. So Ibrahim's life uh, has been uh, long, let me see if I, sorry, uh, has been long um, and um, as he put it. When I met Ibrahim in 2010, he has been, he was in his early 30s. He had recently got a job as a car attendant, or as people say in Alsa, a parking guy, in a cooperative with the local government office had established uh, for the unemployed youth. Uh, this initiative was not a localized one, was part of a broader attempt of the government at the time, the ruling party at the time, to recapture the youth that participated in the riots and demonstration that followed the 2005 election. So um, on top of this job, Ibrahim also made extra money by brokering the sales of se secondhand mobile phones. And in the past, they had, in the past, they also had, they had multiple engagement with both wage labor an informal street economy. He had been a street fighter, as he called himself, but also a skillful hustler, a thief, a manager of video houses, but also a construction worker, a guard, an assistant carpenter, a stone worker, and for a short time, a successful um, shoe seller. Haile, uh, this very cool picture of Haile here, now in his, his, actually his 50, who also claimed to have lived uh, a long life. He had been a student until 14 years of age, then a pickpocket, a burglar, uh, and a daily laborer at construction sites. When, with the collapse of the Dirk, uh, the socialist military junta that ruled the country between 1974 and 1991, he, like many others, tried to find his way out of the country, taking advantage of the fact that the southern borders were not as guarded. So at the age of, the tw of 22, he spent uh, nine months as a refugee in Kenya, um, trying to pass himself as a falasha, or as he said himself, as a fake falasha, an Ethiopian Jew, uh, waiting to be repatriated in, in Israel. Um, as soon as he realized he was not able to uh, leave the continent, he went back to others, uh, and the new successional lives followed. Um, uh, he was, worked as a manager of video houses, then enlisted, um, uh, as a soldier on the Ethiopian Eritrean War. When the war was ended, he was hope, hoping that the status of veteran was going to help him to get um, a kind of economic opportunities and employment. He eventually didn't work and he went back on the street hustling. And then again, hustling after a few years, after, until then 2005, 2006, he was um, um, kind of uh, offered, invited to join uh, uh, the government supported cooperative um, producing uh, precast concrete, blo concrete blocks for government construction sites. This lasted for a while until the government was giving uh, the enterprise highly worked for um, contracts. When they stopped, then he joined highly, highly, uh, highly joined Ibrahim in the cooperative of parking guys um, to support himself and his son um, that's uh, mostly lived with Ayla's mother. So. This is a kind of, you know, just, again, I told the story of the book in, uh, in just a couple of minutes, but it's just telling you the kind of the intensity and the, the intensity and the multiplicity of lives that this uh, highly brain have lived and that the book tried to uh, portray and, and narrate. But the main question I always ask myself is like, how can we narrate and understand uh, a life? Um, 
Hence, ethnography is a valuable tradition in the writing of life histories and exploring the tension between individuality and the fact that existence is embedded in history, cultural notions, and social relationships and constraints. However, what to make of the lived experience is still an open question. I argue that the challenge lies in our ability to explore how people conceptualize and experience the intimate relationships between the life and the, between life and the self. So my informants actually use two uh, terms to make sense of this. So one is bari, which is in a unique character of an individual. Knowing one's bari, however, is not a matter of introspection. The bari is knowable to others, in particular in, in ways others describe you and how you relate to them. Tabai instead was a, a term that people used to describe what people have become through the experiences of one's life. You are what you have lived, but also you can become what you have not lived yet. So being is not just a stable position, in essence, but instead um, being is realized in practice and for work through a process of endless becoming. So this understanding is not just existential philosophy, but it's an understanding of life trajectories that there's a long history, especially in the northern parts of the country, where many communities have conceptualized the life of an individual as a continuum of social experiences and not a succession of well-defined life stages. So in experience of my interlocutors in inner city others, seeing life as a continuum resulted in appreciating life as an open moment of possibility. Seeing life as an open moment, again, is not just a matter of intellectual sophistication or some, some, something deriving from the hope of the ethnographer who tries to impose open-endedness and openness into the life of his interlocutors. We can discuss this, but also argue that the idea of seeing life as an open moment is actually an ethnographic fact, in particular in the ways the open-endedness of life and living can be seen and experienced and understood by those we write about as, as an opportunity, as a way of being something other than one's constraints. So how can we appreciate, sorry, how can we appreciate the complex intertwining of becoming, meaning, and politics and history and everyday life if we often after, after by taking life and living as the matter of our investigation? And how, sorry, I have a quick, Yes, and how our ethnographic account of open-endedness guide the critical appraisal of the present, but also inspire contribution to the, uh, an anthropological contribution to debates about the possibilities of my more just futures. So my wider work seeks to answer all these questions and this book provide all the answers um, by it. So this is the moment of the commercial, but today I'm gonna fly a little bit lower uh, to um, talk about, you know, by exploring life, meaning, and history and open-endedness, I'm made to kind of make a case for rethinking how we understand marginality and exclusion. In particular, we tend to rely on quite cunning uh, and smart phrasing, analytical styles. They namely tend to argue that whatever the marginalized do, they always end up reproducing the condition of marginality. And this is my, this presentation argue against this way of thinking, that even that resistance somehow end up reproducing marginality and exclusion. So I propose a critique of this particular uh, understanding of the vicious cycle of action and reproduction, but also try to sketch a reflection on the politics of ethnography and how um, on, the, on the kind of politics that the closer engagements with life and living can potentially inspire. So, my ethnographic investigation um, of the act of living is contingent on a particular place, others in a particular decade, uh, the decade of Africa rising, and it's specific to the stories of two lives with their particularities of gender, location, and upbringing. The particularity of a given life in a way, however, doesn't limit its relevance, I think. Uh, the uniqueness of a story, as Hannah Arendt puts it, tells about the infinite potentialities of living and existence. At the same time, while unique, existence unfolds in places and times and modes of being in the world that are shared with a range of others. Also, as my work here is about highly brain, but also about the wider constituencies of urban life that we're part of, why described as street life. 
Our street life is not just a synonym for whatever happens on the streets. While, for instance, a street vendor might carry out ease of air activities on the streets, doesn't mean that he or she see herself sharing lives, experiences, and identities and actions with others who also occupy the streets, like street hustlers or sex workers, for instance. So what makes a difference is the extent to which people inhabiting the streets recognize themselves as part of a shared um, repertoire of memories, practices, collaborations, and antagonisms that I describe as here to be street life as mainly revolving around hustling and as madness. Also, while doing my research, I realized I was occupying a specific sociological niche that doesn't uh, fit with standardized interpretation about waiting and weight hurt that usually apply to understand the experiences of the marginalized in many contexts, but also in, in urban Africa. So this kind of understanding of waiting and weight hurt didn't apply, apply here. The reason why this interpretation didn't apply is a particular sociological definition of, or, a, or dimension, sorry, of people acts of waiting. They are often unaccounted for. Um, those who wait are often those who can wait, meaning that the waiting is viable for those who have access to the economy of resources, exchange and opportunities. They enable them to wait for better social opportunities and time their life in a way uh, towards downfall, to time their life towards the achievement of desired social goals. For Harley Brave and many others in the book, waiting was simply not an option. When you don't have much, my informants thought to me, it doesn't make much sense to wait uh, and spend time wondering about the life you wish that uh, for and wait for that to come. Last but not least, that we can talk about that more in the questions, you might already thought about this. This is a story of men. Economists of street hustling, inhabited, inhabited by women in the book, explore the stories of female hustlers and players and smart women. However, we also need to recognize that marginality is both produced and lived as a fundamentally gendered experience. For both serendipity and choice, I can talk about more in the questions. My ethnography is an exploration of marginality within the gendered coordinates, the nexus between subjugation and subjectivities, but also look at the way policies and interventions aim particularly at regulating and controlling men's behavior in, uh, in the city uh, political uh, and urban spaces. So let me tell you a little bit more after this kind of introduction, let me tell you a little bit more about Halei Ibrahim. So in a way, pure chance dictated that Halei Ibrahim were born in households in Addis Ababa, uh, in poor households in Addis Ababa. As many with their friends, Ibrahim and Haile were members of, of the first generation, born in Addis, but from families who originated elsewhere. Their parents were among the many who migrated during the 1960s and 80s and came to constitute the bulk of the population of the capital at that time. As sons of educated migrants, um, uh, rural migrants at the bottom of urban society, you can tell a little bit more about their parents if you want, Haile and Ibrahim could hardly consider themselves to be well off. Yet the experience of marginality was not a result of their parents' lack of means. Actually, their parents had uh, achieved a small but relative trajectory of social improvements uh, relative to the radical scarcity of the rural areas where they came from. Moving to the city was actually an experience of social improvement. In principle, being born in the city within a trajectory of social improvement, the access to an education from which their parents had been excluded from Ibrahim and Hale were a step ahead of the previous generation. And despite this clear advantage, however, Hale Ibrahim soon uh, found out that embarking on a trajectory of social improvement comparable to the ones of their parents was quite difficult, but also um, in some cases impossible. As a members of a generation of the came of age during the socialist regime, they were meant to be beneficiaries of expanding education system, especially in cities. But the vision of progress and social mobility that long characterized discourses on education were oddly reflected on their experiences. As Haile put it, school was fake. It was a place to avoid rather than one where a vision of better future could be cultivated. Um, Ibrahim's neighbor, for instance, Ibrahim also remembered uh, student overcrowded classes led by underpaid and undermotivated teachers. As one of his neighbor put it, teachers were cold. It was not a place when uh, you would like to be, and they're really bitter stories 
of the, the of the school days. In a way, engaging with um, with the, the street economy already while at school, but also throughout the uh, you know the youth and and throughout their life really provided highly dream with the ways of getting by. And getting by, however, should not be simply considered as a generic attempt to survive, but spending time on the streets. So already when they were very young, when they come to, you know, already at school, these young men built their, as young men, they build their networks um, of relationship that still last as they now uh, reign between their 30s, the late 30s and, and you know, early 50s, but also elaborated the sense of self-worth, uh, revolving around ideas and practices of inner city street smartness. Uh, the notions of being a rada is something that is very central in, the, in uh, highly brain experiences. So for those who don't uh, spend a lot of time in Ethiopia, so a rada is the name of the inner city area where I carried out my research of where Ali brain lived. It was a kind of this very center, the historical center of, of one of the historical centers of others. So it was not just, however, the idea of being a Rada and a Rada is not just a matter of on a homonymy, but also a very intrinsic connection, connection between the idea of urban life and the specific place. For my informants, being a Rada voiced the deep fascination that they felt with the ability of the hustler, not just to navigate the place, but also to make do, to be an urbanite, to actually live smartly and toughly through their condition of marginality and exclusion. However, this is not the entire uh, story. I will be a bit ethnographic here. So since the 1960s, being Arada denoted the sociality that pervaded Addis Ababa cafes, bars, and restaurants, especially in the city center. And the, as inner city residents were ready to argue, not all Aradas were the same, and not all Aradas could equally claim to be true Arada, true ur urbanite. So Arada is a place, but also Arada is a definition, and, and, and discourses about the urban. So there were people were distinct, making distinction between the gentleman Arada, let's say the Dembenya Arada, and the thug Aradas in Amharic, Durye Arada. So Dembenya in Amharic means customer, buyer, patron, and conveyed a sense of properness, manners, gallantry, and style that made a person a proper urbanite. Being a proper urbanite, being a proper Arada, embodied ideas of sophistication of an emerging urban middle class made up of students, intellectual artists and singers, but also government officials. And, um, that's, um, and, and, and they use this, this discourse as a way of claiming as a symbol of the distinctiveness between the 1940s and the mid 1970s, but also throughout um, the 1970s and 80s as well. So Duryea meanwhile means something a bit different. It's the Amharic word for uh, thug. Uh, and during era that reflected the fact that the street life and the street economy existed alongside the society of gentlemen and the fact the idea of sophistication and properness um, coexisted, sorry, with, uh, with the idea of, you know, the street economy. For my um, informants among hustlers and thugs, a pickpocket, a con artist and a robber are rather because they master street smartness and street knowledge. A street tourist guy, for instance, told me Arada are the ones who understand other people. Pickpocket is a smart way of being Arada. First, you have to understand the brain of the person and also his, his body. Then you will choose your target. Similarly, brain often reminded me of the fact that I'm from Naples, I'm aware, I should be aware of these things. He said, a smart person could also be a criminal, but you already know this. So middle class idea of sophistication and thugs Street smartness represented two different ways of living in the city or being a rather. And between gentlemen and thugs, there was a long history of social differentiation. Uh, on one end, the strategies of distinction uh, of the gentlemen. On the other, um, in a city, young men attempt to navigate the condition of exclusion. There is an interesting story there in a way they question in each other right to be described them, describe themselves as to be a rather. However, focusing on the thugs, on the Durier, um, being becoming a rather offered a way of um, kind of sort of accepting the presence in the urban space in a way that actually was constantly questioned by middle class uh, Dembenya Rada in a way. But at the same time, by doing this, they also faced the predicament. They granted the actual infiltration with street violence and engagement with illicit activities. 
Street Life appealed to men like Halle Ibrahim, not just because, however, it gave them an opportunity to be violent or masculine. I kind of argue against this kind of way of looking at, you know, engaging with Street Life in crime. Street Life gave them uh, a way of asserting their presence in the city while also obtaining a certain degree of respect and recognition in the community as an embodiment of certain idea of smartness. Again, pointing out how engaging street life could deliver a certain element of respect doesn't mean endorsing street violence and street crime as a legitimate ground for action. Conversely, it's an attempt to recognize the quest behind this. So with Franz Fanon, I read the appeal of crime hustling and street violence uh, for Harry Brim and many others as a sort of embedded in a search for someone else and for something else. And as Fanon acknowledges, this is not a joke. It can be a struggle in which one must be willing to accept the convulsions of death, invincible dissolution, and the possibility of the impossible. So this idea of play with the possibility of the impossible, quite central in people's experiences of street life, in a way gave them an opportunity to, to kind of question what a poor person could be and could do in terms of possibility, in a moment, in a condition of marginality and exclusion that could hardly challenge and, and produce a certain sense of impossibility. So in a way, a street life didn't necessarily give them an opportunity to challenge the question of the condition of exclusion, the something they couldn't do, but provided them a way of living smartly and toughly through it. So at the end of the 1990s, uh, Ibrahim and Hale, uh, experience of street life culminated in the making of their group, uh, you know, we call a gang, but I don't call, I don't use the term gang for various reasons, and I can I'll talk about that later. The group was called uh, Yemot Bedit, which is, you know, the American means the group of death. Ibrahim translated in a more poetic way, those who are destined to die. And the group gained a certain fame on the streets of bits of the inner city of Avarada. Its name actually was not self-assumed. People give it to them because of their kind of style, their ability to navigate the legal um, uh, criminal street economy during the 19, at the end of the 1990s. And as the many, as the story of many groups of this kind in the history of Arada, uh, the group didn't last for long. I, I read it by the early 2000s, just a couple of years, the year the group was formed. Uh, many of the members met the dest destiny spelled in the name of the group those who are destined to die. Uh, Wu Bei was among the youngest. He was found hanged on the ceilings of the house when he was 19. Uh, two more, uh, Samson and Stephanos, followed um, when the spread of HIV AIDS hit Arada. And members of the Yemot Bidib were not only the ones to die during the early 2000s. Um, important pieces of the streets economy in Arada died during that time and the acts of illness, violent death and government depression. Looking back at the days of the Yemot Bedib, Ali Ibrahim were remembered that the death of their close friends was both like a warning of the re risk inherent in the life of a tough life, being a, a tough life, but also a push to find a way out of street life. That tenement respect in the streets was also felt less as an achievement, but more as a predicament. So while Ibrahim and his friends, so in, in talking about the 2000s and uh, and that's when I enter, start beginning the story myself towards the late 2000s. So towards this 10 years, somehow, Hali Ibrahim has been busy trying to kind of find uh, alternative life and experimenting, going back and forth between the street economy and you know, also construction work and so on. And the multiplicity of lives that I talk about at the beginning was actually the product of their constant restless search for their better life away from the streets and also going back and, back and forth in a way. So while Ibrahim and his friends were doing this, the Ethiopian economy had been booming. The capital city, Addis Ababa, was, was beginning the 2000s, but throughout the, um, you know, the past 10 years and so on, witnessed a dramatic transformation. Africa economic growth has been described as being the promise of an ongoing expansion of opportunities for investment and wealth creation across the continent, but also across the globe. And as a foreign investor told to the Ethiopian Business Review, you cannot afford to not invest in Ethiopia. However, growth is not for all. Social inequalities have been on the rise, and we can talk about that a little bit later. And the ability of ordinary citizens to affect policy is still, in a way, still significantly limited. Looking from the perspective of Haile Ibrahim, economic growth actually offered Ali Ibrahim very little to uh, build on on to meaningfully change their lives. 
For most of their lives, they occupy the lower tiers of the street economy and some moments of wage labor. It's combining hustling and construction work. The world of a legit business, meanwhile, was far away to distant from the horizon of possibilities. In my informants into um, reckoning, the economy was dominated by the logic of the relatives are with relatives, and the donkeys are with ashes. But this to say people who are connected are likely to help each other while leaving those who are outside their networks with nothing more than ashes. Uh, development and participation, the key words of approaching to urban poverty since the mid 2000s, soon became part of the problem. The cooperative parking guys Ali Brim were part of was part of a broad attempt to the ruling party to mobilize, integrate uh, the unemployed youth, the way they were described at the time, uh, still lying away, uh, as a way of both uh, pacifying the streets and uh, integrating them in, into the city economy. And, I believe Brahim Mahali joined this government enterprises, enterprise programs, both for out of fear of imprisonments, but also as uh, making ends uh, meet, somehow both. So in a way, by joining the programs, Ali Brahim gained a regular monthly income, but also became dependent, at least at the time of my research, um, on depending on the ruling party uh, at the time for their survival. Even though there were no supporters of the previous ruling party, the APRDF, they understood that if they wanted to keep their jobs, they needed to, they were expected to act as such, um, act as supporters and show up at meetings and rallies. In a way, the implementation of these programs enabled the ruling party at the time to expand its uh, reach into the, into the population, mobilizing significant amount of people. But then from the perspective of Ali Ibrahim and the parking guys and their cooperatives and many of the similar kind of initiatives, they still could not embark in the trajectories of social mobility and social improvement. They continue to be marginal actors of the city and in the city economies while experiencing the increased pervasiveness, pervasiveness of the ruling party at the time, uh, of the ruling party apparatus of political control. And this somehow plays still now. I can tell you a little bit more about that in the questions if you want. So, meanwhile, what happens? Uh, the, the, the cities are exploding, uh, uh, visions of, of, of economic improvements. It was ac actually interesting there that there is actually why there was still um, kind of cultivating the idea of being in a city, street smart for their ability to navigate uh, the economy. There was a wider questioning of, of who they are, whether they actually, do, people like Ali Brain were Arada, were the smart. As an increasing number of people start turning their eyes towards the skyscrapers, the high-rise buildings, and, and the vision of success, my informants actually witnessed the wider questioning of their claims to smartness. Many in the city started to believe, in the inner city started to believe that the Arada are not those who are poor, but they're kind of able to navigate smartly their condition of poverty, but those who are smart enough to get out of poverty and become rich. As Ibrahim put it, now, if you are chista, uh, this is, you know, uh, you're broke, nobody's going to respect you. So, but at the same time, from their perspective, um, what is interesting, opportunities of social mobility were still closed. Um, and meanwhile, there was this high rise buildings, visions of material success. Ali Brim were fascinated by the promises of abundance, uh, but at the same time, they also, by seeing their condition of marginality persisting, they're wondering about the actual foundation of this wealth. Uh, for them, it was somehow both inexplicable and immoral. For them, you highly, highly say, if you're rich, there is something behind you, often told me by moving his hands, as if he were writing a question mark in the air. And people talked to so development as a bluff, as they felt the air, so they could felt they couldn't join the bluff. Sure, they were hustling on the streets, uh, but also felt they couldn't actually um, have the resources to play, to play the big game of faking and cheating that the so rich people playing. As Ali Ibrahim, as Ibrahim said, we are chebetal, we are squeezed, we gamble with no money, we don't have opportunities, we don't have a past, a present, or a future. So this critical account was far from nuance, of course, that was grounded in rumors and perceptions, but also it was a powerful moral indictment of the condition of exclusion and what they believed was the logic behind it but also at the same time was quite immobilizing in a way. On the streets of inner city, the heaviness of constraints imposed on my interlocutor's action were often so overwhelming and, and the immobility, self-destruction, or even death in some cases appear, appeared inevitable. 
and some tragically succumb to this. Uh, there is plenty of stories uh, of of of, 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 uh, of friends and people that you know were in the circles of Ali Ibrahim while I was doing my research, while I've been continuing to do the research, committing uh, suicide. And the way they were talking about this was the idea that um, their condition of exclusion, the way in which, for instance, uh, they, uh, uh, these people's obsession with making sense of what there was in front of them was the reason why people were driven to such um, uh, tragic uh, ends. Um, in a way, um, many people argue that this, this death and suicide was basically a consequence of chinket. They were thinking too much. We can read this in two ways. One, I can argue that this thinking too much, this overwhelming sense of immobility was a reflex of my interlocutor's experience of precariousness and uncertainty, the very fact they're not able to see what next, and this is somehow overwhelming. But what's interesting, at the beginning, I came to with this idea of thinking about that, these predicaments in this way, but then I soon realized that for my interlocutors, uncertainty was not a concern. They actually, the perceived uncertainty has enabled them to think their lives otherwise. In a way, what was known was seen to be bleak and overwhelming, distressing. Pain, anxiety, and madness were interpreted somehow by, by people's potential obsession with making sense of what they had in front of them. In a way, as Haile told me, um, you know, people should appeal to their ability to forget, to take their mind off the kind of their predicaments. And he said, it's nice that you think about what you have to do, but don't do it too much. People get crazy for too much thinking. I like my brain, it's incredible. I can forget things, this makes things easier. And forgetting was a component of a force of discipline of the self that was branded in the recognition that we are thrown into a world without control of the circumstances of our existence. In a way, uh, my informants built a kind of existential discipline around that. So in a way, knowing what was, was not going to be next was a reason to have hope. However, what we hoped for was left generic and unspecified. Of course, they dreamed about you know, living in Bole, with, uh, you know, one of them, and, and driving one of those uh, big cars and so on. But at the same time, they realized that possibility of, of improving their lives was not relying on dreams, but on chances. In America, it did. So in a way, a chance is a stroke of fortune, an event is a series of events that enable you to take your life somewhere else. So in a way it was interesting that they can, while their future, the vision of the future were left unspecified, um, um, the notion of chance is actually quite, uh, as a quite um, religious and moral dimension. Chance is a way seen on one end as a, as a, a deal, as a gift of God, and the, actually the unpredictability of existence and the predictability of a chance is a, is a result of the actual unpredictability, the inscrutability, sorry, of God's plans. So in a way to gaining a chance was somehow dependent on ability of, 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 of people to cultivate relationship with God by uh, going to church, selling the loyalty to him, um, uh, and religious acts uh, of various kinds that I can talk about. But what's interesting also, my interlocutors realized that gaining God's favor was not an easy thing to do. They've been stalling, stealing, and cheating, and hustling, and they were aware this is something they could not be I mean, uh, aware, uh, sorry, they couldn't be, be proud in, while um, relating and building the relationship with God. On one hand, so means like kind of a feeling of, of regrets, but also cultivating good relationship with God was seen to be central. But also my interlocutors build a sort of a constantly work of moral reflexivity, which they recognize that and they, this course of reflection of moral reflexivity really kind of um, had many similarities what both philosophers have talked about when talking about moral luck. The very idea of whether, whether or not what people do in situation outside their control can be an object of moral judgment. So my, for my informants, their bad acts were a result of the fact that they were not in control of the circumstances of their life. They didn't choose to be poor. In a way, what they believed, when you are poor, you need to do, do what you need to do in order to get by. So in a way, they established themselves in a, as, as a, they recognized the contradiction of their society. They, they also reestablished themselves as a moral subject and also feel themselves as entitled as, a, as they reestablished their right to have their chance 
to improve their life. On one end, of course, um, is not getting a chance is not just a matter of, um, of moral reflexivity or just a religious concept, but also recognizes the ability to expose themselves to the possibility of getting that chance. And my informants kept moving. Again, the multiplicity of lives I talked about at the beginning was the result of the commitments to keep moving, to gaining that chance, exposing themselves to the possibility of having a better life. So the Cooperative Parking Guys, for instance, is still there. If you go, some of my, or you might recognize the place in this picture. Um, and uh, however, Haile Brim and many others are trying to find a way out of it, uh, either by finding a replacement to work for them and gaining some bits of the profits of the cooperative, or asking the, go asking the government to give them a part of the capital that the, gov that the cooperative had saved. Ibrahim, for instance, found a replacement to work with him, for him, and handed him two thirds of the salary and gained the rest. Uh, but at the same time, this gave him an opportunity to, um, to uh, combine his one third salary with the income he made by selling and buying secondhand mobile phones. At the end, when we made the calculation, he was not he actually was making less. So it was uh, that he, he, if he had continued to work in the cooperative, but at the same time, he felt that this arrangement enabled him to um, uh, consider other options. As he put it, he put it, Marco, you know me. I cannot just be like this, just doing one thing. I eventually quit the cooperative without getting a share of the capital they had saved over the years. He decided to pull resources with his sister to open a little container shop, like it's very similar to the one you see uh, here, uh, within the government scheme for small-scale commercial activities. In 2015, I was talking about his family shop with pride. Uh, and excitement, selling small items from chewing gums to bottles of water. But unfortunately, by 2017, highly moved about his family shop, a radical change. He realized that the shop had simply replaced one meager income with another. Uh, the prospects of achieving life part two, as he put it, of a life of social improvement for himself and his son was still out of reach. Yet, my informants kept moving. So, Talking about the challenges here, they encountered but getting by on the streets and trying to become something other and the, the, their constraints. Uh, Ibrahim told me, Marco, living is the most important thing. You have this life, we live it. For Ibrahim and many others whose stories are I tell in the book, living was important because staying alive was the ultimate condition for being able to turn the unexpected into possibility. The experience of being alive gave them the sense they still had time to pursue trajectories of social improvements and somehow life, living contained contain the seeds of open-endedness and possibility and the idea that while you live, no final judgment can be done on the life you actually have lived. So philosophers such as, philosophers such as Agamben that has been uh, highly discredited in the debate about COVID in Italy, by the way, we are a little bit there, Philosophers such as Agamben have argued that the desire to be and persist is easily exploited and exploitable. This is because the subject attachment to life contains a, a predicament, where life's assuming intrinsic value and survival becomes the main concern of the subject. The individual is caught in the mechanisms governing the reproduction of capital, uh, capitalism and political subjugation. And I disagree with this kind of way of interpreting those realities. Similarly, we could read my informal search for open-endedness as illusory, fatalistic, or form of false consciousness. If you want to argue this, be my guest. I strongly disagree with the way of looking at it because there is a long tradition of sociological and philosophical thought that either portrays people's desires as an impediment to action or seen limited purpose in understanding the rationale behind people's actions and their meanings. Building on this tradition, for instance, literary scholar Lauren Berlan wrote in a book, Cruel Optimism, that modes of existence potentially similar to the ones that I described so far um, are uh, symptoms of an attachment to visions and desire of a better life, which can be cruel because wittingly and wittingly they're obstacles to the actual ability to achieve one's dreams. Bourdieu would argue that Ali Ibrahim, as they moved around, the choices they made, the trajectories they embarked on, um, uh, wittingly or unwittingly, willy-nilly, contributed to the reproduction of their condition of marginality and exclusion. We can see some elements of this in a way that's, in a way, uh, engaging history hustling. My interlocutors were not able to go anywhere else. 
but the same time, I still strongly disagree with this way of interpreting those realities. On one end, we need to recognize in the way in which the way in which highly brain are being included in the in Ethiopian economy, Ethiopian society, actually reproduce that condition, produce that condition of marginality. But also, I don't want to assume that my informant sense of the possible um, um, coincides with the social position or the fact that a uh, wild sense of the sense of what people can and cannot do is elaborated through their own experiences of power relationships doesn't mean that the constraints imposed on them are internalized as given as a natural. So we should inhabit analytic and ethnographic attention that pervade the existence of interlocutors. The very fact that people try to be something else than their constraints while still living in a life that is firmly embedded in condition of exclusion and subjugation. In a way, the debate about structure and agency, you know, so 1990s, fails us here. The structured agency is never resolved because actually trying to make sense of attention that is ne it doesn't never have an historical final synthesis. This is attention that emerged from the fact that the subject is neither fully determined by power, nor fully determining of power. This tension and ambivalence remains fundamentally unresolved making the experience of be something other than one constraint a very pain, painful one, but at the same time has this tension endures unresolved, people's acting or moving around become a fertile terrain for elaboration of repertoire of practices, of living, of moving around, of assessing and criticizing. And these acts actually produce people's engagement with the history and, and change, and also shape how people position themselves in society, seek to act morally, and live meaningfully. If I have a few more minutes, I will ask this, answer my, this question I always put myself, it comes from my own supervisor. When I was a PhD, he said, okay, you actually told us a story, but so what? Who, you know, sh why should we care? So if you is going through a process of political reform uh, led by uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, who became Prime Minister in 2018, uh, and members of opposition parties have been released from prison and restrictions on media and civil society have been lifted. However, whether these reforms will entail a radical rethinking of the Ethiopian uh, developmental model, and whether this greater enjoyment of political rights will also result in the increased ability of people at the bottom of urban society like Halle Brim to affect policy is unclear. Um, is a good speaker, but if you ask me, it's like when you move your teapot from one fire to another. Ibrahim told me in 2018, reflecting much of the skepticism that populated the streets and in the city others about this moment of political change. When I was back in Addis Ababa early this year, Ibrahim and many others continue to be skeptic about the new political moment because they recognized this moment of change didn't necessarily result in the proliferation of chances they could, they felt they could best boost the, the, uh, the life changes. They were critical of the previous government and they continue to be skeptic on moment of political changes. Um, in a way, I contend that my interlocutor's uh, understanding of actor living is quite important. In a way, by keep moving, they also kind of expected to be better placed than their parents and they hope their children, and you know, Ali Brim had ch children to live a better life than they did. And the search is an attempt, was an attempt to fulfill a generational duty or somehow of incremental improvement. For them, life was about, they used with the uh, American proverb, Rase takto malef, which means leaving, having left your place to another. So it was an attempt to, gener to fulfill a sort of generational duty of incremental improvement. And this actually generated tons of claims demands, not just moving around. Over 10 years, I spent investigating in a city others I witnessed, I witnessed how Ali Brahim and many others expressed constantly claims and demands to NGOs and government institutions that were promptly unaddressed. From giving a pot of money to each member of the parking guys to launch their own initiatives in the, in a, in the informal economy, or to replace doomed life skill training programs into actually employment initiatives uh, focused on cooking and driving, skills that people can use in the labor market. All of them were cast aside because either to be impossible to achieve or irrelevant. So I believe that ethnography can potentially question this politics of impossibility and irrelevance. Pursuing responsiveness to these claims demands will imply questioning the long held idea that the main objectives of social policy are to change poor people's minds, penalize the unworthy 
and the lazy and help the deserving poor to help themselves out of poverty. I strongly, um, I think we should question the kind of way of thinking. A responsiveness, responsiveness then rests on the idea that tackling poverty and exclusion requires a collective effort to question the political and social hierarchies of worth, which produce subjugation and exclusion. And so telling and sharing stories like this one so can potentially be a call for a politics that target, that conceptualize, make sense of poor, people's, poor people as members of society, not as bearers of some form of either commendable or reprehensible morality. Responding to these claims will entirely commitment to reshape politics and policy. And this is not about grand visions of the future. As my informants understood the request for a chance, there's not much point in prefiguring a vision of the future. It didn't work for them. It doesn't work where visions of the future function as a justification of a growing social inequality in the present. Responding to claims demands perhaps revolve around looking at the present as the only measure to understand the effectiveness of policy and in the intervention. Eventually what is required is elaboration of a method that can get us closer to the realization of something better. And this something better, sorry, is not uh, a trade-off by something imagined and re realized openly and collectively within the tangible horizon of the present. When maybe we start cultivating the idea of, you know, of building collective, you know, the idea of something better uh, we reach the moment when hopefully that better world is coming to be. Okay. I, Diego, I'm done. <laughs>